Hello. Uh, this evening, I'm going to talk through a few sentences from the crisis of European sciences. This was a lecture and is a piece of writing, the recording of the lecture, from the philosopher Edmund Husserl. Although he is more than a philosopher, I would argue he also is a reader of people, for he tends to characterize as opposed to posit and develop from a position. A few brief remarks on the man's method before we go into the specific text. You will notice from the title of this discussion, this unfolding of the video, that I used the phrase eidetic reduction. This is a phrase that comes from a motorcycle is driving by my apartment complex. And there's the Doppler effect. And there goes the echo. Here we are. That phrase, eidetic reduction, has in its first part a few letters together that you might recognize if you are accustomed to saying idea. E-I-D-E-T-I-C. Forget about that I-C. Here on this channel, we want to take apart words slowly because the way the orators of the past and the rhetoricians of the future will use language and speak is by going to the roots and parsing, separating at that level so they can grow gardens, not impress butterfly wings behind the bulletproof glass of a universal grammar, of something that just longs to be accepted by a machine. No, rather, we will find idiosyncrasies and twists, turns, flavors, emphases in a word style. And that style will have an insistence, will have a tinniness that gives off the dense person of the original speaker. That verging on the word salad, but my attempt to talk about the return to the roots of words. And if we return to the roots of words, we will find the the upside down trees in the ground of phrases. And then we'll begin to see how compositionally those phrases enlarge from left to right. In other words, remember those ancient Greeks, they did not have spaces between words. They did not have commas, which I am a fan of. And they did not have periods. They did not have capital letters. They did not have punctuation. They had a solid string without gaps. And the onus was on the reader to see the logic, to see the upside down trees of bent, separated roots making the music which is to say where to put the pitch, when to come down. All of this was spur of the moment decidable. And when you begin to think this way, 
you begin to write this way, you find the truth, I would say, disclosed to you, the sense of opening to a horizon and horizon that the paper and the pen, the document on the screen, books on the shelf, they are visual aids. They are not the thing itself. And so this happened to Fitzgerald. In between books, he was writing a manuscript. He went on a trip with Zelda. Zelda was walking with, what's his first name? Robert Fitzgerald. I can't believe I don't remember that off the top of my head. They stepped down from the train and the train with all the cabooses and linked compartments and the final one at the end, off into the sunset, it was dusk. There they were, let's say in St. Louis. And he was in his tie and neckerchief and she was there in a dress, little umbrella above some clouds, not too thick, not too high, but clouds above their heads, people walking and they were looking forward and the opposite direction of that now vanished train, a vacation. And as they began to walk, hand in pocket, Fitzgerald said out loud, oh, I'm so glad we'll have this time together and I'll have this time away from all those other responsibilities because I would like to get some work done on the manuscript. You know the one I'm talking about. And with the solitude and the separation from our society, we will be we will be able to write. And Zelda said, oh, yes, as she was digging through, rifling through, to use a cliche, her purse. <gasps> oh, my goodness, Robert. What? I left the manuscript on the train. And I don't remember where I left it on the train. But I know it's not at the house. And there's nowhere else it could be on the, except for on the train. And the train is gone. And this was before the inter internet. Therefore, there was no recourse. And now with his fists clenched in his pocket, his mouth ajar like a door slammed on a foot, he chose his language carefully. He lost all the pages, all the phrases, all the words. What did he lose again? With this method of disclosure, going to the roots, going to hmm, pattern recognition, he would have lost nothing in his heart. In fact, he would have said, he might have rejoiced and said, ah, blessed are we, Zelda. Now I don't have to wonder where the pages are. You say you lost them. I say we found them. Because perhaps a true writer can write anywhere at any time for any reason, anything. And still the purpose arrives. Now that takes faith. Trust, in other words. What is that? I was going to talk about Edmund Husserl, and here we are talking about Robert Fitzgerald and Zelda and a manuscript in a train. Back to the eidetic reduction. So that EID is the way the Greeks said idea, eidos. And the reduction, forget about that I-O-N, it always goes at the end of many words, many English words. Let it go, that I-O-N, go. 
that reduce, that reduct. Have you ever had the duct work done? D-U-C-T, duct tape. And then R-E, that elusive R-E, loaned from Latin, that reifying thing. That recluse spider, that reduction, that resplendent thing. So a duct, an idea of a duct, an idea of a tapering, of a opening, of a closing, of a path, of a limited, bifurcated, road, jagged, root, R-O-U-T-E or R-O-O-T. And the difference between word salad and that, I would say, is exactly what Husserl is concerned with in his crisis of the European sciences. Because if we didn't have such a clean line between psychology and pure science, would we know if we were speaking nonsense or sense by external objective measures? Maybe instead, we would look to the virtues, to complexes of external and internal for our guiding post and streaming light. We would ask, in other words, am I being clear slash am I holding together? Is there integrity in what I am saying? And you can go on and on with or without paper, with or without a pen, with or without an education. When one pauses in their speaking, they find their lacuna their gap, their personal phenomenal question mark. And then they ask themselves, do I lean in? Do I become the key for this key hole in my articulation? Does it matter to me? Does the question of whether or not it matters to me matter to me? And then they begin what is called proper research. And that might involve years with friends, family, school, church, on a mountain, in a valley, who knows where it goes. But certainly it would be an adventure and would necessitate prayer. That is to say, a concourse, a conversation with the creator of all these possibilities. And the truth would be in the present and the future. So you wouldn't have to know it from beginning to end as you're in the middle. And you could find clues and you would want to find a priest to bring your clues to and have him sift away. You would want to find iron to sharpen your iron. You would, in other words, want society. 
So rather than the social contract theory of Rousseau saying, well, we're primitive animals and we want to lie down on the grass and eat bananas and run, but we can't all do that. So let us gather together and transpose those energies into institutional sandboxes with institutional plastic containers, with institutional shovels of multicolors made of plastic, and we'll learn our lessons, receive our parables, and write constitutions. Now that's a perhaps not charitable reading and stereotypical view of Rousseau's social contract theory. But why do we have to look at ourselves in such reduced fashion? Maybe we're not animals. Maybe we are much more. And consider all the generations before 1751. Without air conditioning, without airplanes, without the internet, without GPS, they built things. But what has science, what has knowledge, what has our presuppositions, what have these watercolors of our experience done to us? Well, that's Edmund Husserl's theme. When he looks at science roughly after the 16th century, now I'm going to read from him. Now this is from section 22 of the crisis of European sciences and transcendental phenomenology. This was published in 1954, Northwestern University Press. And this is free online. If you type in the crisis of European sciences, you'll find this. This is in the, <laughs> it's entitled Marxist.org. I'm not advocating Marxism, but it is free on the internet to read and follow along. At any rate, if you click on the link, you'll see part two, clarification of the origin of the modern opposition between physicalistic objectivism and transcendental subjectivism. Let's give the author charity and allow for all the isms and not judge, but press on. Section 22, or however you say this thing, I don't know how you say that sign, but that sign. Locke's naturalistic hyphen epistemological psychology. When I read the following sentences that I'm about to read to you hour and a half ago when I was having dinner, I said to myself, this is motivation to record a video. Locke, by the way, is John Locke. He wrote a book, an essay concerning human understanding hundreds of years ago. But here are those sentences. It is in the empiricist development, as we know, that the new psychology, which was required as a correlate to pure natural science, when the latter was separated off, is brought to its first concrete execution. There it was, the first sentence. That's what motivated me. Where in the sentence? Like a snicker bar, that little line between the, the peanuts and the brown tofu looking thing. That division is right here, that exciting division. The new psychology, which was required as a correlate to pure natural science when the latter was separated off. In other words, Husserl is saying here 
we would not have psychology as we understand it today if we had not made a prior move conceptually. What? You mean we're not just Rousseauian animals walking around with our eyes wide open, looking at stuff, taking it in and saying, yeah, it's a tree, that's a waterfall, and it's you and me psychology. That's not what's going on here? Husserl, you're saying that psychology might not have been and need not be, but because we made this prior move, a conceptual move of separating off pure natural science from, from what? He doesn't say in the sentence, but from, I'm going to add it, what the Greek philosophers would have said when they said all. If you read a Greek philosopher, especially one of those pre-Socratic philosophers, Anaximander, an ex-enemies, Thales, et al. You'll find that you'll find fragments, first of all, Heraclitus. But no matter which fragment you look at, you will find the word all, A-L-L, or their Greek version, panta, pant, pan. When they looked at something, they didn't stop it at the scope of their eyes. They grasped or reached for a, a philosophical scope, which they captured in the one word, all, which isn't a quantity alone. Because in the pre-Socratic era, they weren't separating off pure natural science from the cosmos. So all, and this is important, all was not a quantity. Neither was it a quality. Because again, they did not separate off what they were doing from what the world itself is with them and their doing in it. Let alone from what society and what it's doing with them in it. They weren't separating. They were indicating it all with all, which I would say is a quantity hyphen quality. Or they might have just said, we don't need either one of those words. We're talking about what all of it is about. But something happened a few hundred years ago. Once upon a time, Edmund Husserl says, and that something was the separating off of the pure natural science. And then dialectically, that word, which is a verb and has been a verb for the last 400 years, with the guillotine falling on people's heads during the French Revolution, terrible. And the apple falling from Newton's tree and this massive induction, this leap, this vaunting from one little case to how planets rotate around stars, Newtonian science. Well, if a planet way over there that I never will go to in my experience, except through my imagination, which is being tutored by the calculus of Newton, I'm putting myself in the attitude of those people back then, a few hundred years ago, Sands the calculus of Newton and Leibniz, I would not be able to discipline, tutor my imagination to understand those heavenly bodies as bodies moving, sometimes colliding, with the precision that I can now and with the precision that you can make GPS 
repeat back to you. In other words, a precision that does not need me to exist, to feel a certain way. And that's the other half of the title of this video, the enigma of subjectivity. We should ask ourselves, if we're pouring our pathos, our logos, and our ethos into something that can be reduced to a map that feeds a computer which can accept it and then sharpen those edges, sandpaper that thing until it's nothing than what it is and it keeps it. I don't know if we've attached the right meaning to the project. Because whenever we attach a meaning to a project, we give it our expectation. And think of that word expectation. Take it apart, EX out of pec, pectoral muscle, the front facing view. We give it our front, we give it our person, we give it our Stand up straight, straight with your shoulders back. We give it all of that. And if we're giving that to something which is ultimately indifferent to us and belongs rather in a CD-ROM, that can be devastating. And so we come back to the question which philosophers have asked themselves for thousands of years. Why are we here? What does it all mean? And I would say Husserl in this essay is inducing that question out of us. Second sentence. Thus, it is concerned with investigations of introspective psychology in the field of the soul, which has now been separated from the body. So he's walking down the staircase of the argument. We wouldn't have the new psychology if we had not first separated the pure natural science from the all. And the moment we separated it, it generated its opposite. Dialectics became a verb. Because this thing is artificial, the pure natural science which we, we have separated from the all, where we don't necessarily belong, in order for us to tolerate it, let alone become familiar, it has to generate out of itself, out of our own cognition, out of our own attendance to this thing which isn't there. A smoke and mirror of antagonism. Why do stories capture our attention? I would say because the story is not there. It's not real. A boring story is real because you know you want it to end. That's a proof of its reality. Who was it? I forget the man. Oscar Wilde. Someone was playing a piano, I mean banging a piano in a, a bar. And as he was walking out of the bar with his friend, he said, I would have a sign posted above this door at the doorpost. Similar to Plato, who said for his school, he would have a sign put at the top of the door, let none enter here who are unfamiliar with geometry. So too, Oscar Wilde said in some British pub, I, British bar, I would have a sign that reads, all poetry, all art is sincere. Where was I going with that? I lost myself. We know when a story is boring that the story is real because we want it to end. It's obstructing something. It's, it's throwing its weight around, if you want to use an empirical metaphor. But a good story, we would say, is one that holds our attention, 
But wait, there is no story over there to hold something from us. There is no there there. So what's happening in a good story is the person telling it or the person who has told it and committed it to a visual aid, a book, uses techniques that stand in for reality. Let's say a real person having a conversation with you in real time. That is being simulated through the techniques and the complex of those techniques. And they're so seamless, that is to say, mistakes are not being made in the process of their unfolding in a reader's imagination, which is the subvocal talking to oneself of word after word after word after word, that you find yourself enchained as if you had stepped on the train with Fitzgerald's manuscript on your lap. There you are. Here it is. I'm in a world. I'm entranced. Until a mistake is made and you're I'm not in a train. I'm at my desk in Ohio. It's 2001. In one of Karen Wong's videos of The Meaning Code, she talks about anomalies. I think this was about a year and a half ago. And she was borrowing anomaly from Jordan Peterson's use of the word in his book, Maps of Meaning. There, Jordan Peterson was, man, this is a long video, 3205. The, um, someone is there and I will stay for, for a few minutes longer. I, I have about three more sentences of this video, but it's going somewhere. The, Peterson in his book, Maps of Meaning, was talking about the phenomenal and how the phenomenal from the Greek word phanestai, or however you say the word, is this idea of shining forth. So not just shining, there's a candle over there, lit. But it's this idea of there's the candle over there lit and the light of that candle, which is the light on the wick, that light somehow is there on the wick and leaping out of the wick and leaping out of the wick and leaping out of the wick. And some of the leaping is further than other leaping so that you have this radiance. If you want to think of it as a balloon, there's the outer perimeter, which is bright. And then you have this inner perimeter, which is an amber, a darker. It, it looks, it looks, it has the idea of more dense, more leapings beside each other, less separation of the leapings until you come to the place where there is no leaping or the leapings are so close, they're infinitely close. And that is the place on the wick, which is that place the wick? Or is it the place of all the infinite leapings together right next to the wick? The question of contact, let alone the question of cause. One of the reasons I love or I am drawn to the image of the candle as an object of contemplation. You can do so many things with a candle intellectually. The ancients did. The church fathers spoke of candles. And they weren't making pretty vacuous statements. They were building things for human beings to consider. And Jordan Peterson was talking about this phenomenon. And as these things are bright around you, there's the doorknob. I don't even have to think about it. My hand going to it as I'm walking out. It's so, here it is, natural, that it's as if the leaping of the first flame, to go back to our metaphor, was so close to the other leaping of the flame, but they're not. There's someone who's commented on my channel. His last name is Rose. 
and he has a wonderful channel. And recently I listened to something from him about Leibniz's situation. And if he is listening to this or listens to this in the future, he will know what I mean here with what I'm about to say. The situation of those two leaps in such close proximity gives a sense of linkage, even if there is not. There is such a similarity that there's almost a reflection, almost a transference, almost a, an indifference of, are you to the right or am I to the left? That doesn't matter. We could, we're so close. We're almost one. The hand to the doorknob as you're intending to walk down this hallway just naturally finds the doorknob. You don't have to stop and look down at it and say, now this is a problem, a three-dimensional problem. How do I navigate this palm right down there to that handle and don't go above it, don't go below it, don't go to the right, don't find it, find it. Wow, this is really hard and three, three lines of that ge geometric plane. Oh my goodness, wow. No, it just finds it. As you're not running into the door, thinking about the milkshake, as you're intending to walk down the hallway, your hand just solves the problem of three-dimensional space and landing on that tarmac of the doorknob and turning. You don't have to, once you reach it, say a miracle. Against all probability, I found the two leapings beside each other and it was so dense. It also then produces this activity of turning and then pulling back. And all of this without you stopping yourself in a stepwise function to say, can I believe, can I infer that the next thing which will happen, the turning, will also be followed by the pulling back? And it will be just enough that I don't throw it back to the wall, but just enough so that I can go through and then catch it from behind and close it. It's marvelous. All while intending to walk down the hallway, which is a sort of microcosm of intending to get to the end of your life, where you're a different person than when you were born into life a different status. All of that is, Peterson would say, negotiated through these phenomena, these shining forth, I would say in the manner that I presented with the metaphor of the candle. There's this outer perimeter, which is leapings further from each other. So there's more guessing. And then when you go in, there's closer leaping. So there's less guessing and there's more natural is the doorknob my hand or is my hand the doorknob in the turning of it they almost become one not quite they're never confused but they're just so right habits and then finally that mystery of with all the infinite leapings and probability distributions of where things could be and how we could walk down the hallway and do i turn it Fast, slow, all the probably infinite variety of fast or slow in between this doorknob. All of that comes to this point where they're infinitely close to each other. Is that on a place that is not the leaps? Is, it, is the light of the candle on the wick infinitesimally separated so that they are two distinct things somehow causally interacting? Or is the wick actually the phenomenon speaking out all the leaps? And if so, that changes our conception of cause. The next sentence, on the other hand, this psychology is of service to a theory of knowledge, which compared with the Cartesian one is completely new and very differently worked out. In Locke's great work, this is the actual intent from the start. It offers itself as a new attempt to accomplish precisely what Descartes' meditations intended to accomplish, an epistemological grounding of the objectivity of the objective sciences. 
The skeptical posture of this intent is evident from the beginning in questions like those of the scope, the extent, and the degrees of certainty of human knowledge, which I was trying to evoke in you, the listener, as I was talking about doorknobs and candles and where is the light or where is the flame? Is it on the wick? Is it beside the wick? Is it the wick? Scope, extent, degrees of certainty of human knowledge. Locke senses nothing of the depths of the Cartesian epoche, E-P-O-C-H-E, which by, by which Husserl means critique, and of the reduction to the ego. He simply takes over the ego as soul, which becomes acquainted in the self-evidence of self-experience with its inner states, acts, and capacities. Marvelous sentence. I think we should read it again. He simply takes over the ego as soul, which becomes acquainted in the self-evidence of self-experience with its inner states, acts, and capacities. Only what inner self-experience shows, only our own ideas, that's the full circle of this conversation today, are immediately, self-evidently given. Everything in the external world is inferred. Your Mac will sleep soon unless plugged into a power outlet. That's my cane around the neck telling me to get off stage. But before I do, I would say I disagree with collapsing all consciousness of doorknobs and candles and flame and church fathers and thinking and praying and eating and being in society. I will not reduce that to the ego, to the I which is such a sliver of life, nor to a point positive that everything else must be inferred from. Instead, what I want to say and what I was using that paragraph to give you a flavor for what I am trying to let go of in my own life, my own thinking, is maybe we could go back to what our ancestors were thinking and talking about before the 1500s. Maybe we could go to a worldview that doesn't have a separating off of pure natural science from the all. And so we don't have to generate dialectically out of that artificial separation, a new psychology that will explain the enigma of subjectivity to ourselves through a series of stories we tell ourselves and fall into and build neuroses out of and justify our addictions through. Maybe we can have a holistic worldview that includes prayer, jokes, high art, low art, every degree of the brow up and down. Now, that's aspirational, but my first attempt to get to, to go there is to leave where I am. And so I don't think there is a separation anymore. Not really from science and psychology. Which means when we when we read old stories, we're not reading fiction in the sense of that which is not pure natural science. That opens up to us what these works of fiction really are, which is to say they're part of the all. But what are they drawing our attention to? And why are some of us drawn to certain books and not other books at seasons in our life? Well, just like I go to that doorknob over there and find that leap beside the leap of my hand to doorknob and turn, as I'm intending to walk down the hallway, as I'm intending to be transformed down the line later in life, maybe certain phrases and parsings and, and words with roots that an author displays or that friends talk about or this corner of the internet gives us a smorgasbord of is us finding our leaping partners and noticing distances that we were blind to before. Good things, good things. That's all for today. Thank you for listening. And I hope you have a good week.
We're almost at the end of it. And before my Mac shuts things down prematurely, I will shut things down voluntarily. Have a good one.